<laughs> that your parents do for you? They feed you, right? Okay, that's good. That's important. You gotta, you gotta eat to live. They buy you clothes. Yep, you gotta have clothes. What else do they do? I'll tell you what they do. They take care of you, that's right. But they also, they, well, yes, they love you. And here's one of the things they do because they love you. They discipline you. And they protect you. Well, I'm going to stop about discipline for a bit. Because this one's maybe not always very fun. But maybe they teach you to clean your room. They make you eat your vegetables. And if you don't do these things, maybe they send you to your room where you get in trouble. Yeah. Do you know why they do that? Because they care. Yeah. Well, because life can be hard, but they're preparing you and making you learn how to be, well, honestly, more like them. I remember my dad used to say that. He used to always say, remember whose son you are. First of all, remember that I love you, and that will never change. But also, live up to the standard that I've set for you. It's not always easy. Now let's get back to Jesus. Jesus loves us so much that he gave up his life so that we could live with him forever in heaven. But he also loves us so much that he disciplines us and he teaches us. He teaches us to live more like him. It's kind of hard to do sometimes, but he cares and he loves us. And he says, remember whose children you are. I will always love you and live up to the standard that I've set for you and I'll help you do it. Sometimes it's not always easy, but that's because God loves us. And we're going to talk more about how he helps us to do that and, and how precious it is that we, can, that we can call him our father and, and live up to his standards. So let's, let's ask him for some help, okay? Let's hold our hands. Dear Jesus, we thank you for loving us so much that you promised us a life with you now and in heaven. And now help us to live up to your standards as best we can. Forgive us when we fall, but remind us that we are and will always be your children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. All right, thank you for coming up. <laughs> we will continue by singing verses 4 and 5 of our hymn. Ben, uh, big grin on his face, 
says what I think every father can appreciate, every father who's have more than one child, I think I'm much more prepared for this one. <laughs> but what a whirlwind. Amen, brother. You know, it, it, that's a lot of work, having a child. Who can really be prepared for it unless you have had one already? More than just holding a little cute little baby in your arms, you gotta care for it, all that comes with it. But is it worth it? Absolutely. Now, let's raise it up a notch. The gift of life that God gives to us, more than the temporal life that we have and our children have, but that eternal life that God gives to us and to our children, the, the, the purity that he sees us, the promise of forgiveness and holiness that guarantees us a life with him in heaven. It's not always an easy one. It's given to us. But in our text for today from Malachi chapter 3, as in many, Jesus tells us that it comes with a lot of work. It's not something you can simply receive and ignore. But the purity that Jesus brings, that purity in God's eyes, also teaches us a purity in this life, which is not always easy. But is it worth it? Absolutely. But this is something that each of us needs to consider. And it's the encouragement that God gives us in Malachi chapter 3, which I will read you one more time. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. This is God. This text, written by the prophet Malachi, was written about 400 years before Jesus came. Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. The next prophet, 400 years later, would be John the Baptist. Malachi talks about the coming of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, and he talks about God himself, Christ, coming to this world. He speaks to a, a people who he says desire this. But what does it mean? Getting the context of where these people live, these people had a hundred years before this time, before this was written, had just returned from exile in Babylon. The people of Judah had been taken off into captivity to Babylon for a very important reason. Because what they desired, the forgiveness and the love and the acceptance of God, they had given up. Basically for one reason. Because it was easier to live another way. Before Malachi, before the, the Babylonian captivity, there were a number of ways this happened. The people, for instance, they cherished that promise of, of life and eternity, but the things that got attached to it, his laws and his expectations were very difficult. To live a chaste life, to live a life of kindness and love to those around you, it's difficult to do. And there were other religions in the world that didn't make you do this. You know, the, the service of Baal or of Dagon or of Asherah let you live your lives physically however you wanted to. They encouraged it even. And kindness to others? No, they encouraged retribution. If somebody wrongs you, you wrong them back. And that's a lot easier to do. And so the people began to flock toward these belief systems. And rejecting God's regulations, they rejected God's love altogether. God wouldn't have it. God loved them. And so God taught them a very difficult lesson. And he brought them into captivity, took them from their land. And they got it. They recognized that in rejecting part of God, they rejected all of God, and that's not how they could live. They couldn't live that way. They repented. They saw the error of their ways. They saw God's forgiveness, and God brought them back. There was a spiritual revival, if you will, in Judea as the people came back. hundred years later, though, <laughs> it began to slip again. Not back toward the worship of Baal or Asher or Dagon, but for the same reason, because... Worshiping the things of this world is easier. 
one of the things they began to slip into, which Jesus would deal with, was the worship of self. And Jesus tells us in his words very clearly that we are forgiven, and all of us need it. None of us can live up to God's standards. None of us are pure. None of us are good. And that's, that's a tough concept to grasp. It's, it's a tougher one to accept. It's a lot easier to think that I am better than you. Isn't it? A lot easier to think that I have lived my life better than you, and therefore, God loves me more than you. People began to slip into that thought. They cherished, they desired God's forgiveness. They desired God's love. And Malachi says he's going to bring it, but understand what else he's going to bring. He's going to bring this purity, but know what it's going to mean for you. It's not just going to mean that God has forgiven you. It does. But it's also going to mean that God will expect you to live up to his standards. And who can stand? That's the question that Malachi raises to these people. He will come, but who can stand when he does? Understand the love that God caused, that caused God to come into this world. Malachi prophesies that John the Baptist would come. John the Baptist would come and he would fill in every valley, he would knock down every hill, so that all mankind could see the salvation of God. And that's what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist came to prepare people. To show people that, that you are not holy in God's sight. That you need God's forgiveness. He came to show people, those who were crushed by guilt, that God has forgiven you. And in this message of repentance, he also showed them that here is now how you can live up to the life that God has given you. This is what Jesus came to bring. In our text from Malachi, he says that Jesus will come... The messenger of the covenant, the messenger of God's promise, will come like a refiner. He will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify our silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. He will come to purify his people. Now we can understand that rightly in two ways. First of all, Jesus came into this world to make us pure in God's sight. This, this we cherish. This we desire, and so did they. We read in Ephesians chapter 5 how, how Christ loved his church, loved his people, so that he would sacrifice himself for, for her, for us, to make us holy and blameless in God's sight. He did this when he took upon himself all of our guilt, all of our shame, took it to the cross and left it there. Being punished for all that we had done, God now looks from heaven and sees you as pure, sees you as perfect. One more passage that talks about this from 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God, this is what God sees. He has made you pure. That is a truth that we cherish. But you'll notice that in this text, God talks about an ongoing refinement. An ongoing purification. If you ever do laundry, if you ever do laundry, do laundry. And sometimes we don't think about it. You know, you put the dirty jeans in, in, the, in the washing machine and you put it on spin and you, and you leave it alone, you don't think about it. But those jeans take a beating, don't they? You think back to how it used to be, or in my case, how you once saw it on TV. You take those, those clothes and you rub it on a washboard. And how they take a beating as you try to get all of that dirt out. There's this ongoing picture of purification that God loves us enough to give. Or purifying silver and gold. You know, you take a, a lump of gold out of the dirt or a lump of silver out of the dirt, what does it look like? It looks like a rock. Until you begin to purify it. And how do you do that? You put it in fire, you crush it, you melt it. Until all of those things that you don't want are gone. And it takes a lot of work. And it, if silver could have feelings, it would hurt as it's purified. But God says that he loves us enough that he's willing to do that for us. The passage from 1 Corinthians 15, God talks about why he came to us in the first place. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. 
You know, God's intent was that we be forgiven. God's intent was that we would live with him forever in heaven, but God's intent was also that we live with him now. He wants us to live lives that show him glory, that show him praise. He wants us to live not for ourselves, but for him. And so he purifies us. He does things that are difficult. He does things that hurt. He gives us his laws, for instance, that, that knock down our pride, that show us who we are. And then he gives us his promise that lifts us up and show us that we are loved. He takes those things out of our lives, or at least shows them the futility of them, that, that our heart sometimes gravitates towards, and yet can undermine our relationships with God, our, our sinful desires, our sinful wants, things that we might think that we need. And the difficulties of life, just the general difficulties of living in this world, God gives us. Why? Why does God give us things that seem so pointless? So that we turn to him. And that may seem selfish, but God knows more than any that we need him, that we can't live this life without him. And so he gives us these things to show us that we, we don't belong in this world. For now we're here. But we have a better place that we are intended to, that God has created us for. And as we live our lives for him here, God protects us, but he does more than this. God inspires us to live our lives for him. God inspires us. When he shows us that he lived his life thinking of us, putting our needs before his own, he inspires us to live our lives for him. And I think back to my father, and now I think of my children, and me think of yours. You know, that, that, one, that one saying always comes back to me. Remember whose child you are. My father loved me. I know that now. Sometimes I didn't. But he loved me enough to also give me standards by which to live. Every good father doesn't just simply love his child and ignore him. He loves his child and he teaches and he disciplines. And one day that is appreciated. Our God loves us enough to not simply forgive us, to not simply promise us heaven, but to work with us, to refine us, to allow things that will hurt, but to strengthen us to live our lives for him. And then, not only will he protect us, but he will receive the glory he deserves. This is what he means when he says in this last couple of verses, then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. This truth we celebrate, that in God's eyes we are pure. Let us never fail to celebrate the fact that in this life God continues to purify us, so that we might live up to the standard, to the calling we have received. Is it worth it? Yes, a thousand times yes. And I pray that God continues to teach us this, to show us what it is worth, so that we might always remember that we are pure in his eyes and that our lives might reflect that, and that the eyes of ourselves, the eyes of the world might see a glimpse of what God sees with his. God grant it. Amen. Amen. And now may this peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, guard <coughs> and keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Once again, please rise and turn to page 20 where we join in singing together, Create in Me.
heaven, as you have so richly blessed the work of our hands, we now ask you to receive the fruit of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. This morning we have a couple of special things to thank God for. Um, this week we've had two births. First of all, the, the son of Bonnie Silvernagel, Chris, and his wife, Echelon Meyer, a uh, little baby boy, Ernest Arlen, on Tuesday. So we thank God for this, this, this beautiful gift and the health of the, the, the mother, as well as Ben and Amber Camps, who on Friday had their little girl, Andy Kate, and everyone is, is healthy and strong. So we thank God for these gifts. I invite you to please rise.